In a poor town covered in darkness, accompanied by some moody jazz, a man walks through the streets bordering the Sea of Lament. Someone's rumored to be heading on a voyage for her four-year journey of the soul. A woman, our player character, has wronged. So he travels across the town, looking to cash in favors until he and a buddy can board a ship after her. But however pressing that sounds, take all the time you need. After all, no one's going anywhere. They're already dead. This is the setup of Act 2 in the point-and-click adventure game, Grim Fandango. One I'm pretty fond of, even covering it in one of my first videos on the channel when I was 17 years old. While I actively cringe when looking back at that video, it's one I still proudly keep up because it was my best at the time and because it was talking about something I loved. It's been about 8 years since that video was released and seeing this channel has just recently passed over 1,000 subscribers, I wanted to revisit this experience and bring you along for the ride as we explore the land of the dead in Grim Fandango. The initial concept of Grim Fandango is an interesting one. When a person passes away, they embark on a quest called the Four Year Journey of the Soul, a trek across the 8th underworld to the 9th, the land of eternal rest. But before dusting off their running shoes, the poor soul meets with an agent. An agent of death, you may assume. Kind of, they're more like a travel agent, who runs the numbers on your total good deeds to see what you qualify for on the journey. Ranging from a sexy sports car, a vessel to cross the seas, or if you're a model person of outstanding character, you get a ticket on the number 9, a train that blazes through the undead odyssey in about 4 minutes. But if you're not that kind of person, or are a bit liquid on cash right now, you're given a stick with a compass and a sincere best of luck. Or, if you've been really bad, you are given a fate worse than death. Employment for the Department of the Dead. Enter our protagonist, Manny Calavera, an agent serving his time as a salesman, but with his current clientele, it looks like eternal servitude might be his ultimate end. Manny's not a saint, but he's clever, so he steals a client from his rival Domino, a person whose vocal work is so well done he's encased in a layer of smarm as thick as Vaseline. That client is Mercedes Meche Colomar, an angel both in her life and for Manny. But when some corruption within the system snubs Mercedes out of her rightful ticket on the number 9 and forces Manny to take the fall, our protagonist and his driver and total bro Gladys escape the office with the help of the resistance of the Department of Death. Now the two are on the run, trying to find Meche while uncovering the conspiracy that caused these events. So, I'm sure as I've been describing the general setup, you've noticed the game's look. The characters, especially Manny, have this paper mache like construction in their designs. The art style for Grim Fandango is one of the most striking aspects for a first time viewer and easily one of my favorite parts about it. They found a way to make a bunch of skeletons look visually distinct, but the part I love the most is the backgrounds. No, I'm not joking, these are incredible. Grim Fandango came out in 1998 and used pre-rendered backgrounds, a technique allowing developers to create highly detailed backdrops without overstepping hardware limitations. And these backgrounds are insane. At the time, this was cutting-edge tech, but while it does show its age now, I would argue that works in its favor. The backgrounds have this feeling of nostalgia, a state of limbo that seems to exist forever, much like our characters in this afterlife, preserving this era of game design. The backgrounds have this cozy atmosphere that makes me want to get a bunch of the lads, grab our sleeping bags, and camp out at some locales. Some premium spots include the Department of Death, all of it, Maximino's Club, the Docks, and one of my personal favorites, Rubicava, during the end of year one. The fog enshrouding part of the screen and the subdued color of the sky gives the feeling of a sleepy portside town that would be indifferent if you and some buds plopped down with a couple of brewskis and enjoyed the scenery. But while I've been mentioning how cozy some areas are, the backgrounds also convey this sense of paranoia and loneliness. A lot of Year 2 scenes capture that feeling. The vast darkness shrouding the screen could be hiding anything, conveying this sense of awe with its scale while also contributing to the player's fear. And when you consider the game's influences, a blending of Aztec folklore with art deco and a film noir plot, that feeling becomes incredibly apparent. 
The score, composed by Peter McConnell, imbues these places with a strong sense of personality but also adds to the emotional feelings of the scene. Check some of these out. One of the most memorable parts of Grim Fandango for me is how quotable the game is. The dialogue written by Tim Schafer is incredibly fun, but goes above and beyond by being character driven, which elevates the jokes, at least to me. I want to play you a couple of my favorite lines. So, how'd you make out of the poisoning? Well, let's just say that Sister Calabaza has a secret passion. For trains. You got a nun? Hail Mary! Can you teach me how to do that? Well, um, since you're a beginner, why don't you practice the first step? Which is? Blow! Hey, man, you didn't see me put the secret ingredient in these coffin shooters, did you? Relax. Olivia stole the recipe from me in the first place. Yeah. She steals from the rich and gives to me to pour. Did you kill much when you were alive? Very little. And the one quote I think about the most. Nice bathroom! Alright, so we've talked about some of the immediately appealing parts of Grim Fandango. Now, I want to talk about the part I'm mixed about. And that's the gameplay. On one hand, it feels very fitting. Manny, as a character, isn't the strongest or the coolest thing since sliced bread. But his quick thinking and his willingness to embrace the absurd, following a tangled sense of logic, makes sense. The game is a point-and-click adventure, with most of your interaction either talking to people or using objects to progress. You store your items in your coat pocket, which is a fun way of holding stuff on Manny's person, and while sometimes the puzzle solutions are well foreshadowed and make sense, there are a couple times I was dumbfounded by the answer, even playing it years later. And I want to highlight one of those leaps in logic puzzles by discussing the steps necessary to get a union card. In Act 2, you run across the streets of Rubicava to cross the Sea of Lament. You'll need some tools for Gladys to do his job, a slot open for you to board, and a union card to guarantee employment. You can't ask the Seabees for the latter because theirs were quite a pretty penny from Chow Leader Charlie. Charlie is a total scumbag, but a useful scumbag, so you head to your club where the dude is currently staying. He says he can make you a union card if you retrieve a suitcase for him that he lost at Maximino's racing track. I will now explain what I had to do to get the suitcase. I hope you're sitting down. So I first went to Maximino's club, flashed the VIP pass I got from Charlie, walked around the club, and asked Max about the money. To which I got this in response. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. He says you have a lot of it. Oh, I got a lot of it, but none of it's his. <laughs> <laughs> okay, makes sense so far. I find the kitchen area with an elevator leading down, so I think, okay, I've got to sneak down there. I notice a large cask and think I can sneak in. So I walk up to the top, but notice it's sealed. Now here's where it gets wacky. I then discover a can opener near the racing cat's litter room. So I walk back to the club and use the can opener on the cask, but it's full. What I'm supposed to do is walk over to my buddy Glottis at our club, flash the VIP pass for him to reveal his secret problem with gambling. He's now at the racetrack. So now I use the can opener, but Manny says it's still full. When I walk down, the waiter, Leroy, Raul, tells me to leave and checks the storage room right nearby. I then close the door on him and use my scythe to lock him inside, where he panics from claustrophobia, knocking himself out unintentionally, then Glottis shows up, walks into the kitchen and drinks the cask. Then after using the can opener, I can sneak in, to where Glottis shows up again, frees the waiter, and says, La keg is la empty. empty. So someone brings down the keg and I'm into storage. Are we done yet? Not a chance, bucko. I grab a forklift and head up the elevator. 
but that's not where I'm supposed to go. So I head back down. Not supposed to do that either. You see, what I'm supposed to do is start the elevator. And you see those small notches in the gate? I'm supposed to position the forklift iron grabbers into the gate while I'm moving to a secret room in the middle. Then, after getting it stuck, get out of the forklift and press a button on the side so I can enter the room. Then I find the case. I love this game quite a bit, but respectfully. What the bathroom? And rinse and repeat the chain of absurdity for faking the death of a sailor you want to replace without his permission and teaching a bunch of CBs to control the means of production, which gets them arrested to where you need to blackmail a lawyer to get them out. As a way to progress the story, that sounds awesome, but as a development for gameplay, it left me scratching my head years ago and again when revisiting this game years later. But what kept me sticking around some extremely confusing puzzles was its story. The game follows the four-year journey of the soul, each year ramping up the stakes before the finale in year four. And while there are some action moments that make the game feel like an interactive film noir that often cracks a joke or two, there's a subtle hint of loneliness throughout the game. While the backdrops are beautiful, they're mostly empty, and you're alone in these interactive spaces. But it's when seeing other people that the feeling starts to sink deep into your bones. That idea sprouted for me when I visited the coroner, Memberillo, in year two. You can talk to him about why he's staying here. The exchange goes like this. Memberillo, why do you stay in town? Why don't you head off toward the Ninth Underworld? Manny, you can only search for something for so many years before you stop believing in it altogether. You don't believe in the Ninth Underworld? Why do you think we're all here in Rubakava? Because you're waiting to earn off your time or you can't afford passage or... Manny, we've given up. All of us. When you've been here long enough, you will too. And once I heard that, it changed how I viewed the non-player characters. While a lot of them were funny or had some witty dialogue, what I was looking at were people who were tired who responded to the chance of journeying to the land of eternal rest with a shrug and a sigh. And that melancholy is pervasive throughout the game, especially Rubikava in year two. Most people there aren't saints, but they're not awful people, and most have given up their search, settling down and marking this place as the next best thing. In fact, nearly every antagonist in the story, with the exception of the big bad and a certain lawyer, don't even consider the Ninth Underworld a possibility. Instead, they're focused on making their lives in the Eighth as comfortable as possible. This confuses many. The whole point was to leave this place. And here, these villains are making life worse for others, stealing their chance at salvation just to make their position here more enjoyable. I like this setup and how the adventure feels like a fantastical hero's journey, traveling through the underworld. But I appreciate the game showing you these lost souls who've decided they're done searching. Because while it is sad to pass them along the way, it makes your progress feel earned because you've seen people stop looking. But before we conclude this video, I don't want to leave it on a downer. So let's bring back up one other thematic point of the game. Spoilers for the plot of Grim Fandango, but if you're watching at this point, I assume it's either because you've played this game before, which good on you, or you're intrigued but not enough to play an obscure point-and-click adventure game from the 90s. Either way, welcome aboard. Playing back through Grim Fandango again, I noticed the importance of bonds between people. Manny Calavera has the unspoken power of cartoon logic, but the only reason those opportunities are available is because of the relationships he's cultivated. He met Meche before Domino because Glottis fine-tuned the bone wagon, which could only have happened because Manny reached out to Glottis. His voyage into Year 3 occurred because of his relationship with Velasco. The Resistance and their ultimate success occurred after Manny helped them in Year 1, which led to their organization growing. Whether intentionally or not, the moments Manny shared with others rippled into the finale, and you could say that's a standard practice in storytelling. But when comparing it to those lost, who gave up, maybe there's a point to it after all. Those who stopped did so alone. They didn't have people with them, so it was a solitary thing when they ceased, with no expectations from other people. But I think a strong reason Manny, Meche, and many other souls made it on the number 9 was that they did so together. They braved the hardships knowing they weren't suffering alone. And while it's easier said than done, 
any steps to connect with those around you might ripple into something far greater down the line than when you first expected. Grim Fandango is a game I love quite a bit. There's a lot about it I've grown to appreciate more and more as I get older. The adventure it provides, the look, the dialogue, and the moments when you solve a puzzle and feel like a skeletal Sherlock Holmes. But there's a line in the game that's been stuck in my head for a while, and I want to share it with you just before this video ends. Maybe you'll get something from it. When Meche asks Manny if they'll be together in the Ninth Underworld, he says this. You know, sweetheart, if there's one thing I've learned, it's this. Nobody knows what's gonna happen at the end of the line, so you might as well enjoy the trip. Thank you for watching. I like to read a poem. Forgive these five sins. Why? A single calcified tear in the slaughterhouse of my soul. Skibi baba. Skibi baba. I reach out, and what's worse, my teeth. My pop! Go, baby! And what's worse, <laughs> I'm not laughing out of joy. Inside a dream, inside a dream, inside a dream. For, For what, what purpose? purpose? Explosion. Bang. The end. Hey, how about another poem? Okay. Forgive, Forgive these please. five sins. Why? A single calcified tear in the slaughterhouse of my soul. Ski be ba ba. I reach out, and what's worse, my teeth, like, pow, go baby, and what's worse, I am not laughing out of joy, inside a dream, inside a dream, for what purpose, explosion. You stole my poem. Consider it an homage.